Uh, can you people hear me? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Screen is full screen, right? Yes, sir. Yeah. So let's begin. Uh, so we have been talking about the properties of the accretion disk of the supermassive black hole. So we said that the gas falling onto a compact object uh, would lose its potential energy right and which will first get converted into kinetic energy now if this gas which is infalling if it is not stopped then the gas will eventually fall into the black hole and uh, it may not radiate the energy at all it will just get accelerated and fall into the uh, black hole and uh, be lost it will increase the mass of the black hole but it won't generate any radiation. But usually what happens is that this gas does not fall in directly into the black hole because the infalling gas tends to have non-zero angular momentum, right? And because of friction with other particles and uh, the resulting transfer of momentum, uh, the gas tends to assemble in a disk, in the form of a disk, uh, oriented perpendicular to the direction of the angular momentum vector. Right? Uh, higher the angular momentum, the more thin, geometrically thin will be the disk, and the faster will be its uh, rotation. Right. We can assume that the frictional forces in the gas are much smaller than the gravitational force. So the motion there will be almost like a free particle in orbit around the black hole. So the disk will locally rotate with approximately the Keplerian velocity. So Keplerian's Kepler's laws tell us that the velocity decreases uh, as uh, one over root r as you go further and further away uh, from the gravity uh, from the source of the gravity and what will happen therefore is that the kepler disk kepler uh, disk that is formed around the supermassive black hole will tend to rotate uh, differentially which means that the angular velocity will depend on the radius and the because of this because of this differential uh, rotation of different layers of the gas the gas closer to the supermassive black hole will tend to rotate faster than the gas which is uh, located further away from the black hole and because of this there will be internal friction between the uh, uh, different layers and this will cause the gas in the disk to get heated. Now, once the gas begins to get heated, naturally, uh, the conversion to, from potential to kinetic energy is not total. Uh, not all of the potential energy lost will manifest as the kinetic energy of the gas. Uh, some of it will uh, manifest as heat. And when that happens, the kinetic energy is not enough to keep uh, the gas in a stable orbit around the supermassive black hole. There will be a deceleration and that will cause the gas to slowly move inwards in a sort of spiral kind of motion. So what is essentially happening in the accretion disk is a conversion of potential energy to kinetic energy initially, and then a conversion of some of that kinetic energy uh, into internal energy of the gas uh, through this kind of frictional process. 
Now, if the virial theorem holds, okay, half of the potential energy uh, that is released it will get converted into kinetic energy. And uh, what will that manifest as? It will manifest as the rotational energy of the disk. And the other half of the potential energy that is lost uh, can be converted into uh, increase in internal energy. Now, let us consider a mass M that falls from a radius R plus delta R uh, to a radius R. How much is the loss of potential energy in this process? You calculate the potential energy at R, uh, subtract the potential energy at R plus delta R, and uh, you will get this expression. G R by R. This is, of course, an approximate uh, approximation. Here, we, what we are doing implicitly is we are neglecting the self-gravity of the disk. And this we can do by assuming that the biggest contributor to the gravitational potential is the supermassive black hole. In that situation, this expression is, is correct. And then if you say that, okay, half of this energy is going to get uh, uh, converted uh, into, uh, into the internal energy of the gas, then uh, you get this expression, which is given at the bottom, uh, G times mass of the black hole uh, times the mass accretion rate. Remember, there's a dot on top, which tells you this is a derivative of mass with respect to time. And uh, divided by 2 R square times delta R. Okay. Uh, this factor 2 came, uh, came from here. Otherwise, the expression is, is the same uh, that is happening there. We have to further assume that the energy is actually emitted locally, right? Which means that energy is not getting transported by the bulk flows of the gas. So heat is generated uh, because of the heating uh, there is of the gas, uh, there is some uh, thermal emission, right? And as the gas becomes hotter and hotter, uh, the thermal emission uh, moves to shorter and shorter uh, wavelengths. So that is what is happening. So the gas gets heated and it doesn't stay heated and just fall inwards. It actually emits energy uh, locally. That is why, because we are assuming that this energy is getting uh, uh, emitted at a radius R uh, within a ring of width delta R. Throughout this analysis, we are going to assume that there is cylindrical symmetry, which is a very reasonable assumption because you have a thin flat disk, uh, which is going around. Uh, there is uh, radial symmetry in all directions uh, uh, along the disk, but uh, perpendicular disk to the disk, of course, there's no radial symmetry. Okay, so, uh, M dot denotes the accretion rate, which is the amount of matter that is uh, that is coming in. Okay, uh, it also denotes the mass that falls into the black hole per unit time interval. And why is that? In the stationary case, M dot is independent of radius. Otherwise, mass would tend to accumulate at some radius. So the same amount of mass flows inwards uh, per unit uh, uh, time through any cylindrical radius. That is uh, what, we, uh, what we can assume safely because the situation is, uh, uh, is time stationary. Now, if the disk is optically thick, then the local er emission corresponds to that of a black body. So there is a gas which you are uh, heating uh, in a geometrically thin but optically thick, uh, uh, optically thick uh, accretion disk. Then you can calculate what is going to be the luminosity in this ring of emission between R, uh, having a radius R and a, a width of delta R. So what is the emission that's happening between uh, radius R and R plus delta R? Uh, that can be calculated with this expression, okay? 
So what is this? Delta L is two times two pi r delta r. Two pi r delta r is the uh, area of the disk that you are uh, considering. Two because the disk is two sided and is going to emit radiation uh, from both sides of the disk, and its emitting surface area is therefore twice two pi r delta r. Uh, and then we just use uh, uh, Stefan, the Stefan Boltzmann constant and the fact that this is a black body emitter. So it's going to, if it's at a temperature T, uh, it's going to, the uh, luminosity will be proportional to uh, sigma times uh, T to the four uh, times the emitting area. So this is just our usual uh, Stefan Boltzmann law. Now you can now rewrite uh, this equation, okay. Uh, uh, what you do is you, you have expressions for R delta L uh, over here, uh, which you equate uh, to this expression that you have over here and uh, do some rearrangement of terms and uh, uh, you get uh, this kind of expression, okay. Now, We've made some, some approximations. There are people who have done more exact calculations, uh, both through an, an, analytics uh, and uh, also through numerical simulations. And if they do that and account for the fact that uh, part of the generated energy uh, is being used to heat the gas, uh, whose thermal energy is also partly advected inwards. Okay, if you do that, uh, you are left with, uh, with this expression. Now tell me what, what is meant by advection? Does anyone know? No, sir. Uh, advection, advection. Energy with, in horizontal yeah. direction. Yes, so it is basically bulk flow in the horizontal direction, okay? So typically advection is used by uh, people who study things like ocean currents and things like that. Uh, they, they use that to model the horizontal flow of water in the sea, uh, water uh, through these various currents. So here uh, advection is used in that sense. There is, could be, horizontal motion of the gas inwards, right? And that will lead to uh, 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 some energy uh, uh, getting uh, lost, meaning it won't get radiated. It will eventually go into an inner layer where it may get heated further. And therefore, if it is heated further, it may actually become more luminous because uh, you know that the, a black body, which is at a higher temperature, not only radiates more at shorter wavelengths, it also radiates more total energy, right? Uh, I mean, as t to the four. And therefore, uh, they may actually be more luminous uh, if they don't actually if immediately radiate the energy, but advect the gas inwards, heat it further, and then radiate it. So if you do this sort of exact calculation, uh, or more exact calculation, you still get the same result, except that the numerical factor is, uh, is now higher uh, by a factor of three. Okay, And this is primarily caused by uh, some of the gas getting uh, advected inwards and radiating not in this uh, between R and R plus delta R, but at some lower R and therefore at a higher temperature and therefore becoming uh, more luminous or hotter. Okay, so this represents the temperature profile of the accretion disk for all R, which is much greater than the Schwarzschild radius, right? And why is that? Suppose you have a, a Schwarzschild black hole, non-rotating black hole, and it has this accretion disk around it, what happens to orbits uh, that are very close to the Schwarzschild radius? 
and they won't be stable they won't be stable so this sort of smooth stationary state that we are seeing things are slowly falling into the black hole uh, will not be true because once you come within three schwarzschild radii the orbits become unstable uh, what happens if you have a rotating black hole a kerr black hole a uh, rotating black hole there are uh, two scenarios if it's rotating uh, along with the direction of uh, uh, rotating gas it means it have same angular direction of the angular momentum is same as the black direction hole. of accretion yeah yes and uh, and in other case uh, if there are if the direction is i mean counter rotating hmm so, so con consider the simpler case where they are uh, rotating in the same direction what will happen in uh, when they are rotating in the same the same direction uh, uh, there the more inner orbits uh, there will uh, as compared to the st stationary black uh, stationary black hole the uh, the stability will be more inwards i mean correct correct so you don't have to uh, stop at three times the schwarzschild radius like a schwarzschild black hole for a kerr black hole you can go somewhat uh, uh, inwards right that is correct but generally what what we have assumed but nevertheless even for a kerr black hole you will reach a point depending on whether it's a maximally rotating one or not uh, you'll at some stage you will reach a stage where it the orbits are no longer stable and uh, things will uh, get uh, quite badly disrupted also what tends to happen is that uh, as you come closer and closer uh, to uh, uh, the black hole uh, the tidal effects the tidal forces which goes as 1 over r cube when the r becomes very small then the tidal effects are uh, become significant and they will tend to disrupt the gas so if a gas cloud is sort of slowly falling inwards it will be ripped apart if it comes very close to the uh, schwarzschild radius right okay but assuming we are still in the regime where we are far away from the uh, event horizon uh, at where r much greater than the schwarzschild radius then we can actually scale this uh, thing with the uh, with the schwarzschild radius okay so you can write rewrite this equation uh, for the temperature profile in terms of the schwarzschild radius right and uh, that expression uh, is is given here okay now you can always write the schwarzschild radius in in terms of g and mass of the black hole okay so you write it as 2 gm by c square uh, substitute that over here and cancel whatever you can uh, over here and then you are left with some numerical constant okay it's really fascinating that uh, uh, around a very supermassive black hole uh, you have a scaling factor that can be exactly determined Uh, using uh, fundamental constants right so this is your constant factor and now there is a dependence on on three things and what are those three things the mass accretion rate uh, the mass of the black hole and the distance uh, from the center so we are we are trying to write it in terms of in terms of r and uh, scaled by the schwarzschild radius so we are going to uh, measure the radius in units of the schwarzschild radius and uh, and this is the power so there are three different powers here m dot raised to 1/4 mass of the black hole raised to minus half and the radius raised to minus 3 by 4 right let us look at each of these in turn okay so first thing one must realize that nowhere in this equation the there is anything that involves the detailed mechanism of the dissipation okay 
we are not specifying whether it's hydrogen that's falling in or helium that's falling in. We don't care. Okay. We care about how much mass is falling in, right? We don't care uh, about the viscosity of the gas, right? Whatever be the, the viscosity of the gas, it doesn't matter. The details of the dissipation do not determine uh, the uh, temperature. The temperature profile is uh, dependent only on some fundamental constants, the mass accretion rate, the mass of the black hole, and the distance that you are uh, from, the, uh, from the center of the black hole. So what will happen here is that, remember, the temperature has, has a radial symmetry. And the total emission of the disk, therefore, is going to be, to a first approximation, a superposition of black bodies at, uh, consisting of rings with different radii at different temperatures. I think this is a very important takeaway message that the accretion disk has a radially uh, symmetric uh, or cylind cylindrically symmetric uh, radial dependence, uh, which uh, with the hottest layers being closest to the Schwarzschild uh, uh, black hole or the Kerr black hole, very close to the black hole and the coolest gas being away, far away from the black hole. Now, because we are seeing uh, uh, the radiation from each of these layers, right? Each of these radii are radiating independently at different temperatures. What we see is the superposition of many, many black bodies, right? Uh, in the case of the sun, we don't see that, right? We don't see that because what, what happens is that the outer layers or the, the body of the sun itself is optically thick. So although there is a radial dependence in the temperature profile of the sun, uh, what we see is emission only from the optically thin uh, or uh, outer surface, okay, which we can see directly, which we call as the photosphere. So although there is a temp, all the temperatures uh, uh, exist within the sun, we see photons uh, from the sun as they emerge from the photosphere. And therefore, we see the sun as an approximate black body. But in the case of the AGN, because we are seeing not only the solar surface-like temperatures, but much hotter temperatures as you go closer towards the black hole, we are seeing the spectrum as a superposition of many, many black bodies. Okay, And therefore, it does not have a standard Planck shape and shows a much broader energy distribution. In fact, this is the most direct explanation that we have that uh, there is, uh, if you look at AGNs, uh, power emerging in X-rays, in uh, uh, UV, in optical, in near infrared, etc., etc. Because it's coming from different layers. The lower and upper bound of the frequency interval is determined by the lowest and highest temperatures uh, of the disk. So now let us let us see why uh, why would there be a, a, a inner uh, uh, limit to inner uh, to the radius? Why is there a lower limit to the radius? What happens to the gas when it comes very close to the black hole? Does it keep spiraling stably inwards? The tidal forces strip it away. Yeah, to strip it away, the orbits themselves become unstable and it, it, just, it just falls inwards. Uh, it, uh, it does not maintain a smooth uh, orbit. So that will create a inner uh, uh, minimum radius. And the outer ra uh, radius of the disk, okay, 
it depends on uh, whether the gas is accreting and how it is accreting and when the disc becomes optically thin it's no longer optically thick if it is not optically thick then the radiation that is emitted locally right uh, may not get through to us right i mean it get through to us but not much will be emitted locally right it will not be the optically thick case where all the radiation has to come out uh, uh, at that location so you won't see it okay so what will the total luminosity of the accretion disk depend on what are the three things that so what is what is the main thing which will determine the uh, luminosity of the accretion disk so when it accretion rate accretion rate will determine it in something else and the mass of mass of the black hole yes but something more important remember uh, the luminosity goes as sigma t to the 4 okay so it will depend on how what is the highest t you can achieve highest temperature you can achieve in the accretion disk and what will that depend on okay let let me let me pose the question differently Suppose you have a, a Schwarzschild black hole of a certain mass and you also have a Kerr black hole, maximally rotating Kerr black hole of the same mass. Which, and you have the same mass accretion rate, everything else is same. Which one of them will be more luminous? A Kerr black hole. Yes. Why? Because uh, uh, it will have more, much more, the radius will be much more inward, so the speeds will be much more higher. Yes, right? So the Kerr black hole will have an accretion disk that extends further inward than the Schwarzschild black hole because there are more stable orbits inside because of the rotation, right? And therefore, it's going to have, if you look at the temperature profile, when you calculate the temperature profile, everything else is going to remain the same. Mass accretion rate is the same. Black hole mass is the same and so on. You are going to be able to reach to a smaller R. So let us, let us go to this. You, all of this is the same. This is the same. This is the same. But because you are able to achieve a smaller R for the curved black hole, you are going to get a higher temperature and therefore a higher luminosity, right? And temperature, because of the strong temperature dependence uh, of uh, black body's luminosity, uh, you will get it, right? Okay. So therefore, effectively, the efficiency with which uh, mass is converted into energy right, which is your L over m dot c square, right, depends on the spin of the black hole. If you have a Schwarzschild black hole, the efficiency of energy conversion is maximum 6%. And it increases to 29% for a maximally ro rotating black hole, right? So this is something to uh, keep in mind. Now, naively, if you think about it, do you expect to uh, that black holes will uh, have no rotation or do you expect that black holes will have rotation in this whole picture that we are building up? Uh, 
so most of them will have rotation because they are also formed from the stars which are generally rotating uh, okay. yes but they are also accreting gas which is rotating right yeah so it also uh, yeah it also depend in uh, which if the angular momentum of the accretion is same as the angular momentum of the rotation of black hole then it may yes. be increase or decrease correct correct it will generally increase because see remember the the black hole is not forming uh, uh, independently of uh, uh, the galaxy it's not forming somewhere else and somebody is taking the black hole and putting it uh, at the center of the galaxy right it is coeval with the galaxy right so very often i mean there are of course examples of counter rotating cores and things like that but usually the motion of the rotation vector of the galaxy as a whole uh, is very often not always very often coincident with the rotation vector with the angular momentum vector of the accretion disk which in turn is uh, quite well aligned with the angular momentum of the black hole itself right okay okay so now let us look at the dependence on uh, mass of the black hole on the accretion rate uh, and the radius we've already looked at we have said that if it uh, if you can go to lower radii uh, with a fast rotating black hole uh, you are able to uh, uh, generate more energy out of the same accretion rate so it becomes more efficient in converting mass into energy now if you look at the dependence on the mass accretion rate uh, the dependence is exactly what you would expect because uh, energy emitted is proportional to t raised to 4 it's also proportional to m dot and therefore it comes as no surprise that t is proportional to uh, m dot raised to 1/4 no surprises there however if you look at uh, a fixed ratio of r over rs the temperature decreases with increasing mass of the black hole uh, this implies that the maximum temperature attained in the disk is lower for more massive black holes how would you explain this so there is a my uh, mbh raised to minus half kind of uh, dependence right so more massive black holes uh, seem to uh, attain lower temperatures why is that at a fixed r this seems counter intuitive right a more massive black hole should have uh, a bigger accretion disk which it does okay but the accretion disk seems to be such that it at any uh, radius uh, in uh, units of schwarzschild uh, radii uh, the temperature is uh, lower for uh, the more massive black hole um sir is it related to the how we measure the temperature how do we we measure the temperature by measuring the black body and fitting for it that's yeah. the way we measure the temperature so, so that's we are measuring the temperature whatever be the mass of the black hole in exactly the same way uh, so so for a more massive black hole uh, the pot uh, the photons that is coming out of it uh, will have to uh, they will be in more much more uh, much more deeper potential well uh -huh. compared to the high as compared to the low mass black hole so it uh, they will be much more red shifted gravitationally red shifted 
yes so I yes guess that is that is that is true huh? that is true but that is why we are taking things uh, uh, in units of the schwarzschild radii not in terms of the absolute radii if what you are saying is correct if you say that i will be uh, one uh, half a kiloparsec uh, from the center of the black hole uh, then the potential will definitely be deeper for the more massive black hole right uh, uh, that is true. But if I take it in terms of the Schwarzschild radii, in units of Schwarzschild radii, I obviously have to go further away by a distance r. And then the potential will uh, at a distance r is uh, just 1 by r, right? So that doesn't come into the picture. So what else? What is actually causing the the disk to get heated accretion disk the differential rotation and the friction yes, due to correct. the differential rotation friction uh, yes that is that is one factor what is the other factor that is that is tearing things apart shear force between the uh, layers of the differential rotation. Yes. And uh, uh, can you think of this as a tidal force? There's going to be shear, frictional shear, but there is also going to be tidal disruption. And where is tidal disruption stronger? Near the, uh, near the short child radius. Near the Schwarzschild radius, but at uh, for a le if you take a less massive black hole and a more massive black hole and go, uh, let's say five Schwarzschild radii, ten Schwarzschild radii for both of them. Yeah. Which one will have a stronger uh, tidal force? More massive one. More massive black hole in I units of Schwarzschild radii. I think less massive black hole will have less massive black hole because remember, see, gravity falls off as one over r square, but tidal force falls off as one over r cube, right? So it's it's very very radius dependent. It falls off very rapidly, much stronger. So the gravity here will uh, be be uh, will be the same, right? Because you are going in units of Schwarzschild radii, but the uh, 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 the tidal forces for the more massive black hole will be weaker. Okay. Okay. So, okay. Now we ask another question. Uh, does this mean that the maximum temperature of the disk uh, in an AGN is lower than in accretion disks around Neutron stars and stellar mass black holes. Do you believe this? So I take, uh, let us say, a stellar mass black hole which has an accretion disk. Remember, accretion disks do form around black holes typically in a situation where there is a binary uh, star with a black hole, that binary star maybe expands and fills its Roche lobe. And when it does that, matter gets starts flowing from, uh, uh, from this uh, star uh, onto the black hole and forms an accretion disk. So exactly the same thing that we have for an AGN uh, can happen for a black, uh, stellar mass black hole. Now, what we are saying is that uh, the, uh, the stellar mass black hole uh, should have stronger tidal forces at a fixed radius in terms of units of Schwarzschild radius. Okay, So don't think of it as a physical radius. It's scaled by the Schwarzschild radius. So it, it's going to be much smaller physical radius. Doesn't matter. But what we are saying is that that should be uh, the tidal forces should be stronger and therefore the heating should be higher and therefore you should have a much, much uh, higher temperature 
being achieved uh, for the uh, stellar mass black hole. Do you believe this is correct? Hmm? Any reason to believe it is not correct? Okay, let me tell you, this is absolutely correct. The, the accretion disk around a stellar mass black hole will hit a higher temperature than the accretion disk around a uh, uh, supermassive black hole. So if this statement is true, then what are the implications for X-ray emission? The flux of X-ray emission will be higher in case of stellar mass black hole as compared to the AGN. Yes, yes. So actually it's not the soft X-ray because the way uh, 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 the temperature profiles go, there's plenty of soft X-ray emission from AGN. Uh, what is missing from AGN usually is uh, hard X-ray emission. Whereas you commonly see uh, hard X-ray emission uh, from, uh, from stellar mass black holes. Now, uh, what, what is, so here's an example, okay? So this is an image uh, uh, of the Sombrero hat galaxy, one of the nearby galaxies. And each one of these sort of blue dots or circles that you see is a X-ray binary uh, emitting strongly both in soft X-rays, but also in hard X-rays, uh, which you wouldn't see this. I don't think this galaxy is an AGN, so you don't see the uh, blue emission from the AGN itself. But even if this were an AGN, uh, if you looked at it exclusively in hard X-rays, uh, you would, uh, the AGN would be very, very weak. And these, uh, 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 these uh, X-ray binaries would be uh, shining brightly. So this is coming from the accretion disk of the, uh, uh, the accretion disk around the stellar mass black hole, which is emitting in X-rays, uh, hard X. By the way, what is the difference? Uh, uh, how do you tell soft X-ray from hard X-ray? What's the definition? Soft, soft X-ray have energy less than 10 EV, 0.1 EV to 10. Uh, KEV, huh? not, so, not EV. Okay. Huh? KEV, KEV. you're right. So if energy is less than 10 kilo electron volts, then we say the X-ray photon is soft. And if the X-ray photon's energy is higher than 10 electron volt, uh, we say it's hard. So hard X-rays are higher energy X-rays than soft X-rays. Right. Okay. So how many of you have seen the movie uh, Interstellar? Yes, sir. I have seen it. Okay, Manish. Anyone else has seen it? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah. 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 So, so several of you have seen it. So uh, there is a supermassive black hole that comes in that movie. Uh, it is called Gargantua. Uh, it is uh, uh, lying at the center of the galaxy and it is supposed to be, uh, the gravity is supposed to be so strong uh, from the supermassive black hole uh, that uh, uh, gravitational time dilation effects are, uh, are dominant. So when these uh, astronauts land on the planet, they are told that uh, a few hours on the planet will translate to many years uh, away on Earth in low gravity. Okay, So this naturally implies that the planet is really very, very close uh, to the uh, supermassive black hole. But it is not getting uh, tidally disrupted. right? So what can we say, therefore, about the mass of the SMBH? 
will it be on the low side or will it be on the high side? Will there be a limit on the mass of the black hole? it will be on the high side because as you said uh, lower mass black holes uh, uh, the tidal disruption uh, is is uh, is possible at very far distances yes correct so there will be a minimum mass of the black hole so people have gone and tried to compute this and they say it has to be above about 160 million uh, solar masses so much more massive. So our black hole is about four uh, or five uh, uh, million solar masses. This will be at 160. So 40 times more massive, at least. Would it have an accretion disk? Would it be an active AGN? Look, to have gravitational time dilation of this factor, okay, many thousands uh, of uh, slowing down of time, uh, you must be really, really close to the black hole, right? So this, this guy is not in a, uh, orbit uh, uh, 50 Schwarzschild radii away. It wouldn't work, right? It has to be very close. And we've increased the mass of the black hole so that we won't get tidally disrupted. So then what can you say about the accretion disk? Remember, this is a planet on which humans are uh, uh, walking around and trying to explore it and so on. So would it have an accretion disk? You wouldn't because if you had an accretion disk and you were so close uh, to the black hole, the temperatures and the radiation that uh, you will get from the accretion disk will be so strong that it will just fry the planet. It will not be able to stay as a planet. So this has to be an inactive uh, supermassive black hole. Uh, would it be maximally rotating? Uh, yes because it will yes. make inner orbits much more stable. Uh, you know, it will make it possible to go quite close to the uh, event horizon uh, without getting disrupted. Uh, could it have a full size uh, main sequence star going around either the black hole or uh, the planet and uh, the star uh, going around the black hole? Could it, could it have a star or does it have to be a free floating planet? What will happen to a solar size uh, star if it is there? Very close to the event horizon. It will get tidally disrupted, right? Because see, remember the tidal disruption depends on the dif differential force between the two ends, right? between the two ends of the earth, the uh, differential force is what determines the amplitude of the uh, tides in the sea of the earth. If the earth were larger, that differential force would be larger and the tides would be stronger. So similarly, a million kilometer uh, diameter star uh, would likely get disrupted uh, by the uh, uh, by the SMBH and as so this is what the so-called tidal disruption event that we've mentioned once before the infall of uh, that disrupted star would also create so much radiation uh, that the any life on the planet would get uh, uh, fried. So if the planet needs some source of energy what would that energy be? Okay, this question I will not answer, but uh, uh, I'm going to put up one or two papers uh, for your seminar based on uh, this. 
people have been having a lot of fun uh, uh, writing research papers on uh, on whether uh, this uh, uh, planet uh, could realistically exist or not and they put physical constraints so you need very very special conditions uh, for the planet to exist but there is nothing uh, beyond the realm of possibility uh, that prevents uh, such a planet from existing very close to the event horizon of a supermassive black hole at the center of the galaxy, of a quiescent galaxy, for sure. Uh, Kip Thorne has written a book. I have not read the book, uh, but it's supposed to be quite interesting. It's called Science of Interstellar, uh, which talks about not just this particular uh, supermassive black hole, but all the other uh, sort of strange things that they have shown in the movie. Okay. So forgetting all that, that was just an aside. Uh, we, you can, this is the slide is the sort of take home message of the accretion disk. Uh, the accretion disk is rotating. Uh, mass is uh, spiraling inwards. Uh, in the stationary state, it has a constant uh, mass accretion rate. So that is growing the uh, size of the black hole, right? The efficiency with which uh, uh, mass is converted into energy uh, depends on uh, how far in you can get and therefore depends on the spin of the black hole. The faster, uh, faster spinning black holes uh, are the ones that convert mass into energy most efficiently. More massive black holes uh, seem, uh, seem to have uh, only emission in in uh, in the lower X-ray bands because they don't have uh, enough. Uh, the inner parts get all tidally disrupted, and therefore there is uh, the accretion disk does not extend inwards far enough to reach very high temperatures that you need for emission of hard X-rays. Uh, but soft X-rays are seen in many of these. Uh, there is a radial dependence of temperature from the innermost part of the accretion disk. Uh, you get X-ray emission from somewhat further outside, you get ultraviolet. From further outside, uh, you get optical. And further outside, you get near infrared. But by the time you come to the mid infrared, uh, you often hit the uh, outer uh, limit of the accretion disk. And AGN do show mid-infrared and even far-infrared emission, but we believe that emission is not coming from the accretion disk. Uh, that emission is coming from uh, dust uh, in the form of a torus uh, that surrounds the accretion disk. In the next lecture, we'll start talking about the unified model, uh, wherein we'll talk about the mid-infrared and far-infrared emission. So the features that you see in, uh, in the AGN spectrum uh, are well explained uh, by the presence of an accretion disk, which generates copious amounts of high energy photons, uh, which in turn either heat up the dust, which causes it to uh, uh, emit in mid and far infrared, or they heat up the, the gas clouds that are located at a somewhat larger distance away from the accretion disk. This massive, massive influx of high energy photons uh, creates the, the broad line emitting gas clouds as well as narrow line emitting gas clouds, which we have already ma seen manifested as broad emission lines and narrow emission lines in the spectra of AGN. Okay. So I'll talk a little bit about advection. Uh, there is very little that can be done uh, analytically here. It's all done via uh, numerical simulations. Uh, so we will uh, uh, just mention it, right? So far, we've assumed that the disk is optically thick and that is leading to emission locally. The optical depth of the disk naturally depends on its surface density. We said it's geometrically thin. So unless you can pack a lot of material, the surface density is very high, it will not become optically thin, thick. 
and naturally surface density depends on the accretion rate in a system where the accretion rate is very low the disk may become optically thin and the emission process of the heated gas can become inefficient right in such a case the gas is not forced to cool uh, in situ and the thermal energy generated by friction in the disk does heat up the gas but before it can radiate away that energy the disk the the gas itself flows inwards and gets advected inwards uh, the energy as well as the gas go inside such a accretion disk uh, uh, is called an adaf adafs is a short form for advection dominated accretion flow and this kind of accretion is rather inefficient in converting rest mass into uh, luminosity so the in such a case the accretion disk will have very low luminosity and its corresponding efficiency will be very small but such an accreting flow a very very slow uh, accretion flow from an optically thin accretion disk can still be efficient in generating outflows so when we talk about jets we'll talk about how adaf can uh, uh, lead to uh, the radio emission uh, from galaxies uh, uh, that we see on very large scales so in radio galaxies we now believe that there is very low accretion rate relatively inefficient uh, if measured in terms of how much mass is getting converted into light uh, we call this kind of adaf mode as uh, the radio mode of the agn the high efficiency mode where uh, advection uh, uh, is not dominant much of the energy gets generated because the mass accretion rate is very high and the surface densities are very high the uh, accretion disk is optically thick and so on this high efficiency mode is known as the quasar mode so radio mode and quasar mode you will uh, you will see uh, quite often once you start uh, reading the literature so people have gone and tested all these ideas uh, using uh, numerical simulations of uh, of uh, agn formation Uh, these simulations are based on simulations of galaxy formation in very large cosmological simulations so about 20 years ago there were something known as the millennium simulations uh, which simulated the formation of galaxies so uh, darren croton and collaborators have done enormous work uh, on on extending these simulations to simulations of Uh, the agn with the accretion disk and so on and they have also followed it up they made predictions based on the simulations which they have tested with observations of uh, uh, agn in many many different bands and when they have done this they they found a very very broad uh, uh, confirmation uh, that this is the case so agn seem to operate in two modes a uh, radio quiet mode which is called the quasar mode which is radiatively very efficient so although it is not very bright uh, in the radio or not at all emitting in the radio that uh, agn can be quite bright at uh, other frequencies on the other hand there are many agn uh, which are fairly bright uh, in the radio they uh, generate these uh, large radio lobes uh, containing enormous amounts of energy but if you look at them from the uh, uh, from the perspective of the efficiency of the central engine then that efficiency is very low and we refer to that this inefficient uh, uh, mode as the radio mode so uh, 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 there is a paper by croton et al uh, 2006 uh, and of course many subsequent papers by the same group uh, which gives the 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 first picture wherein they propose these simulations and they use observational data from the sloan digital sky survey uh, to check uh, their predictions okay so uh, a couple of small things so many uh, uh, 
uh, years ago, many decades ago, uh, Bond, Bondi, Hoyle, and Littleton uh, uh, did, uh, did a lot of interesting work uh, on how accretion may happen onto stars. Because in the 1940s, people were trying to understand how uh, stars form, right? And there they talked of a spherically symmetric uh, uh, gas distribution, which is falling, uh, falling inwards due to some, some core. It may be a black hole, uh, uh, which is the gas itself is, uh, is homogeneous with some density rho infinity because it's located very far away at infinity and has some uh, sound speed of the gas of CS. And the gravitational pull by the black hole would cause the gas uh, to have an invert directed uh, uh, velocity under the assumption that the gas is adiabatic. Then the mass accretion rate can be calculated uh, from the equations of fluid, fluid dynamics. And uh, that gives you uh, this equation. Of course, we know that for the central uh, region or the region uh, of the accretion disk. Uh, in that region, this kind of assumption of uh, spherical symmetry is totally wrong. But as you go on uh, scales, let's say ten times, hundred times larger than the than the accretion disk then the infall of material uh, could be uh, reasonably well approximated by uh, some kind of spherical symmetry. This accretion rate uh, gives you an indication of the mass influx onto the accretion disk, provided that the angular momentum of the surrounding gas uh, uh, is very small. It can flow in as per this equation until it reaches a radius where the angular momentum becomes important and the gas is then forced onto circular orbits forming a uh, accretion disk. Pure spherical accretion there where the gas has zero angular momentum and no disk is formed is very inefficient, right? So that is why we don't believe that you can form a effective AGN by following the uh, a spherical uh, infall model uh, right to the very end, which means no accretion disk. Everything is just falling onto the black hole uh, uh, radially inwards. Uh, in such situations, only a small fraction of the kinetic energy gets dissipated and radiated away. So this kind of spherically symmetric collapse is not able to explain the high luminosities uh, that we see from the accretion disk of AGN. So this may still operate uh, in the own, but only in the most quiescent situations. By that I mean uh, a black hole which is essentially not active. Uh, let's take the uh, the Milky Way black hole for example, and uh, it is slowly some gas may be falling towards uh, the black hole, and maybe uh, since it we know for sure it doesn't contain an accretion disk. Maybe the gas is falling in in a sort of slow, uh, symmetric way. Okay, uh, no accretion disk is formed, and a very small. Uh, uh, there is a slow growth in the black hole mass, and there is an even slower growth. Uh, the, there is an even slower uh, energy loss uh, due to uh, radiation or the luminosity of the black hole. Okay, so I think I will uh, stop here. And uh, if you have any questions on uh, what we covered today, uh, I will take them. Uh, we will, uh, we have now sort of completed the, the overview of the accretion disk. Uh, I still have to talk about uh, jets, uh, how they are formed and how they transport energy from the inner regions to far away, uh, outside the galaxy as well. Uh, we also need to talk a little bit about the high energy emission from, from black holes and how we can study the X-ray and gamma ray emission to uh, learn more about what's going on in the AGN. And then, of course, I also need to cover the uh, unified model 
uh, which covers, which brings together all the phenomenology that we have seen so far into one big coherent picture. So that will be sort of in the last two lectures, we'll talk about the uh, unified model. So are there any questions? So if not, we will stop here. Uh, just a small announcement. I uh, have not yet uh, completed uh, making the assignment one. I will try to do that uh, uh, by tonight. Uh, but don't worry, whatever time I put it out, you will get three weeks of, uh, of time to uh, finish it. Okay, so uh, we will uh, stop now. Thank you.